Hello, and welcome to the first episode of The Weird Chronicles, a brand new Etherfox show from the team that brought you Tales of Malifaux and the Earthside Echo. Each episode, we'll be broadcasting riveting tales from the Weird Chronicles magazine. For this inaugural episode, we're going all the way back to issue one and revisiting the history of Malifaux. I hope you enjoy. Malifaux. A Background by Nathan Caroland and Brian Emick 1787. The Year of the Breach Malifaux Whether in the whispered rumours of the general populace, or the secretive hushed tones of the guild, it is a word always spoken with fear. For years it had grown more and more evident to everyone that magic was clearly in decline within our world, even the greatest of practitioners found it increasingly difficult to perform the most mundane acts. Some argued that we had become too dependent on magic, that we needed to return to a more natural state. On the other side of the debate, it was pointed out that practitioners, especially healers, improved the quality of life. In 1787, the most powerful practitioners of the day came together and united themselves to discovering new sources of power. Although the process of how they discovered this new power is still a source of debate, they found a world just outside of our existence, a thin barrier separating our world from it, a barrier that could possibly be opened. The raw, magical energy that emanated through it was too powerful to resist. In an unprecedented move, some would say an act of desperation, the sorcerers worked their greatest magic ever and tore a hole through this barrier between the two worlds. The resulting destruction was massive. Many of the weaker practitioners fell lifeless from the resultant explosion that moved between the two worlds. The city where the breach was opened was flattened. The life force of its inhabitants ripped from their bodies as an equilibrium was established between the two worlds. Those that survived found their powers increased many-fold from simply being close to the breach. They say that great deeds require great sacrifice. Both were accomplished that day. It was called the breach of the Great Boundary, a ragged hole that seemed to be torn from the very fabric of reality itself. A darkened tunnel extended 30 metres wide, 20 metres into the air, shimmering as a mirage in the heat, connecting the two worlds. A cold wind blew through the breach and brought with it the faint smell of old death. Exploratory teams were quickly gathered to scout this new land and bring back some of its secrets. On the other side of the breach... These teams found a large city similar to our own world. However, all those that crossed the breach that day knew this world was vastly different. Many of the buildings bore strange writing, some carved into the brick facades, some painted onto the wooden doors. After searching the city for two weeks, not a single living thing could be found, not a trace of human or animal. Also, there was no signs of battle, no corpses, nothing. It was as if the inhabitants had simply disappeared. The most learned of scholars were allowed entrance to this strange new world, to study the signs and symbols in an effort to learn what may have happened. After months of research, they found that the city had been called Malifaux. The signs and symbols on the bricks and doorways were simple store signs. Mercantile, tailor, blacksmith. Other signs, though, seemed puzzling. Death surgeon and mechanical magics. Throughout these explorations, no records could be found that gave any indication of what had befallen the previous citizens. Three explorers moved farther out, 
seeking answers, but also seeking the source of the magical power they felt surrounding them. Several miles from the city, they found a small settlement that strongly resembled a mining town. There were a few wooden buildings, many of them crumbling. A large hole was cut into the hillside just west of the town, with a shaft leading down. Their explorations soon turned up a gem-like substance that radiated more power than any practitioner had ever felt. The stones came in a variety of hues, some more powerful than others, but within them there seemed to be a storage of latent magical energy that a sorcerer could tap into rather easily. The scholars found references to these magical stones in old manuscripts. They were called ether, and the manuscripts spoke of great power within them, but also great danger. The practitioners didn't care about any danger. The stones held power. There was a rush to harvest and gather these stones in great quantity, as practitioners of all skills and abilities could use them to power their magic. The practitioners also noticed side effects with the stones, that as they used the power of the ether, the stone grew dark, its magical energy depleted. Eventually, though, it was discovered that a stone's magical energy could be replenished when it was brought in close proximity of a person as they died. This curious effect earned the ether the nickname of soul stones. After six months of exploration, the breach was opened to the general populace. A thriving trade was established between Earthside and Malifaux for those daring enough to harvest the soul stones. The crumbling boom towns away from the city of Malifaux were rebuilt, and those willing to brave the harsh environment populated them to work the soul stone mines. Many practitioners moved to Malifaux in order to further their magic, and with them came families, servants, and many others that would cater to the needs of those moving to this new land. Life in this manner continued for little more than a decade. The salvation of magic was at hand. Seventeen ninety seven or ten PF Post Forest. The border town of Malifaux became a thriving city over the next decade, growing fat and rich with the harvesting and trading of soul stones. However, the dangers of the land began taking their toll on those that moved farther and farther from the breach. Rumours and stories began to circulate about tombs that held dark secrets and power even greater than the soul stones. Entering those ancient burial sites had given life to the dead, waking protectors of those dangerous secrets and powers. Exploration teams were sent out, but few returned. Those that did talked about fantastic creatures and beings of mythology and fables that were soon named the Neverborn. No one knew where they had come from, or why they had only recently begun to show themselves, though it was quickly discovered that man was no friend of theirs. Some practitioners did discover a couple of those secrets, including the magic of reanimating the dead to use as slaves and drones. Other practitioners found ways to manipulate dead flesh, turning a once-living human into a horrible abomination. The practice was seriously frowned upon, and these necromancers became outcasts of society. Other practitioners focused their studies on the machines that were found throughout the city and the surrounding land. Although many of these devices were rusted and incomplete, some could still be powered simply by placing a soul stone inside the metal. Many of the machines were simple things, little more than toys. However, there were other machines, great machines with great weapons, that could be brought back to life with the right soul stones and a practitioner with enough power. In the winter of 1797, one of the worst blizzards to hit Malifaux during the time of man's occupation arrived, and the great boundary suddenly became unstable. Despite the best efforts of the practitioners, the breach began to shrink in upon itself. 
all attempts to enter the breach were rebuffed, as if some force had cut off any access through the barrier. Worse yet, sounds of a fierce battle drifted across the boundary from Malifaux, accompanied by screams of horror and suffering. In the early morning hours of that long night, despite the most desperate measures taken, the breach shrunk to the mere height of two metres, and a choking smoke rolled through it from Malifaux. Just before dawn, the practitioners drew closer to the breach as the screaming and sounds of battle grew silent. Fear clearly etched into their faces as they wondered what had transpired in Malifaux. A mangled body came hurtling through the opening and landed with a sickening squelch as the breach of the great boundary closed in upon itself with an ear-shattering howl. The practitioners gathered around the corpse and found a single word carved into the ruined flesh of its torso. Oz. Seventeen ninety-eight, or eleven P.F., post Forest. A time of shock and turmoil fueled the panic that ensued after the falling of the Great Boundary. Despite the best efforts of the most skilled practitioners, the breach could not be opened again, even with the assistance of powerful soul stones. Unfortunately, many of those soul stones were destroyed in the process. Magic was once again threatened and soon wars were launched in order to secure the remaining soul stones. Depraved and dark acts were enacted to capture additional life forces within the stones to power the workings of spells. The Guild, a society of ruthless merchants, politicians and practitioners, was formed to bring some semblance of order to the chaos. It took control of the soul stones with an iron fist, as well as the area where the breach had once been, they passed a law that forbade anyone from possessing soul stones except for official guild representatives. Breaking that law was punishable by immediate execution. With the number of soul stones quickly dwindling, their power became completely exhausted. The guild instituted measures to ensure a way to continue charging them, since society had become too dependent upon them to let their power diminish. Soulstones were routinely renewed at hospitals, prison institutions and facilities that housed the elderly and sick. Although considered cruel by some, many saw it as a necessary act of preservation. 1897, or 110 PF, Post Forest. Exactly one century after it had closed, down to the very minute, the Great Boundary once again tore open the veil separating Earthside from Malifaux without warning. However, unlike the first breaching, the death and damage was relatively minor. The return of the breach caused panic throughout the Guild, as they were certain that whatever calamity had befallen Malifaux a hundred years earlier was about to be played out Earthside. That didn't occur, though. After a month of intense battle readiness, the Guild sent a heavily armed exploratory group through the breach to Malifaux. They found the city empty and partially in ruin, the signs of a battle having been fought. Interestingly, some of the signs of combat appeared fresh, as though the battle still raged on after a century. However, there weren't any remnants of those lost, or even any remains to be found of the people that had been caught on the other side of the breach when it collapsed. The Guild now had control of a quickly renewable source of power that they had built their foundation upon. Like strong drink to a man that is a slave to his vices, the practitioners quickly demanded access to Malifaux once again, arrogantly believing that they could handle any disturbances that might come along. Learning from the follies of the past, by allowing so many powerful practitioners and skilled labourers to be lost in Malifaux, the Guild instituted a practice where criminals and other undesirables were given a choice. Relocate to Malifaux and work for their freedom, or face continued persecution. Many took this opportunity, though it is said that the Guild also used this system to rid themselves of problematic individuals and as a form of punishment for those that didn't support the iron-fisted rule of the Guild. 
Naturally, where there is opportunity, there are those that will face the unknown, no matter the dangers. Malifaux had an influx of rough, skilled men and women seeking power, treasures and adventure. These individuals caused the guild some concern, but they produced, and soul stones were delivered. With a workforce comprised mostly of social undesirables, criminals and even anti-establishment radical elements, the Guild put a governing force into place to watch over the collection and delivery of soul stones back to Earth. Life is harsh and hard in Malifaux. For those that buck the system or do anything that might halt the shipment of the Guild's precious stones, it is also short. However, there are those, though, that have garnered enough power or wealth that they are virtually untouchable. This is what every man, woman and child within Malifaux strives towards, power to live their lives at their will, or to buy a return trip through the heavily guarded breach. 1901, or 114 PF, Post Forest. Four years have passed since the reappearance of the breach. Much to the Guild's displeasure, it has been learned that several other breaches have been discovered. While none are nearly as large as the main breach, the Guild is now faced with the loss of total control of access to Malifaux. This, in turn, means that they may not have a complete monopoly on the Soul Stones, though they do their best to stamp out any competition. Although Malifaux itself is well on its way to being rebuilt by the Governor-General of the Guild, there are large portions of the city that see little, if any, human inhabitation. In these areas, the darkest parts of the ruins... Something lurks and has lured and destroyed more than a few work details and security groups. The Governor-General has declared these portions of the city off-limits to all, and has erected walls and bulwarks, many of them cutting across streets and alleys in an attempt to restrict access to, and from, the darker side of Malifaux. The Governor-General has a nearly impossible job of keeping a giant and chaotic city of vying interests under control, while dealing with persistent reports that strange beings are awakening across the continent. He has found that the most expedient way to deal with this problem is the issue of writs to various groups and factions across the city and continent. He gives them limited power to police the part of the city or the outer towns and keeps them at each other's throats. After all, if they're fighting each other, they're not fighting against him. The men and women here hammer out a life amongst the harsh lands they have chosen to work. Towns and other settlements have sprouted up farther from the breach, ostensibly to work the soulstone mines, but also to lessen the looming presence of the oppressive guild and their for-the-greater-good laws. However, it has been noted that should you have plenty of soulstones, influence, or enough combative prowess to give the guild pause, then you are fairly free to make or break the rules as you see fit. There are whispers and rumours of covens and other groups that have wiggled out from beneath the thumb of the Guild to forge their own power base. The combative atmosphere has become thick within the last year, and more than one skirmish has occurred between competing factions, as well as with the Guild itself. To make matters worse, the Neverborn have resurfaced, and a common knowledge to all within Malifaux as they seek to cull a human herd for their own pleasures – or bargain unnatural powers to the unwary or the insane. These creatures take on forms of legends, myths and nightmares deeply ingrained in the human psyche, though it's unknown whether or not they are the true source of those old legends. What their goals are and whether or not they were responsible for the loss of the original colonists and the reopening of the breach isn't known. The only certain thing is that they've shown themselves to be a danger to all men. Recent discoveries of powerful artefacts have brought a new interest from the various powers within the land, and there is speculation that one of these artefacts caused the destruction of Malifaux 100 years ago. Along with the scramble to recover soulstones, everyone is searching for these artefacts that seem to hold great power within them. However, any attempt at retrieving an artefact has been known to bring the Neverborn down quickly, and it is only the truly strong, or the very lucky, that manage to retain control of an item for long. The Guild can feel their power slipping away. 
entire groups of people are appearing in Malifaux without authorization and bringing chaos with them. Mercenaries are renting themselves to the highest bidder, and it isn't always the Guild. In addition to all of their other problems, the Guild is beginning to find it difficult to gather power since necromancers began taking control of the dead. Even though the Guild has declared necromancy a crime and put out a bounty on all the practitioners of the dark magic, they are known to employ a few. However, few are willing to try to capture them, since those that have attempted it were either sent back in pieces or became lifeless slaves themselves. In an effort to retain their power, the Guild has stepped up their already cruel and heavy-handed authority, swearing that they will stop at nothing to completely control Malifaux, along with everyone and everything in it. Everyone can feel it. They all know it's coming. In the dangerous and deadly world of Malifaux, things are about to get much, much worse. That's all for this episode. I hope you enjoyed our story. Join us next time for more Tales from the Weird Chronicles.